For every battle won, a war has been fought. A war in the shadows. A war of lies, deceptions, and an occasional truth. Greetings, loyal members, and welcome to this Dominion War special episode on spies and intelligence gathering. This is one I've been intending to make for quite a while because it's quite critical to how the war plays out. Even if it's not immediately obvious, a lot of the decision making happening in the background will be shaped by the war of espionage that is taking place at the same time. And in many ways, it actually will predate and postdate the war for any single engagement of fighting weeks, if not years, of careful, meticulous intelligence gathering and analysis will have taken place. And so it's very critical to understand this process in order to understand the decision making that takes place during the war. And with that in mind, a lot of decisions that at first seem strange start to make a lot more sense. So let's get right into it. First thing to do is to bring you up to date with where the intelligence services of the combatants find themselves at the outbreak of war. The 24th century prior to the Dominion War was in many ways the golden age of espionage for obvious reasons. It was a time of peace and in such a time spies are free to really conduct their business how they see fit. Objectives are far less based in winning tactical gains. Uh, there's no direct military purpose that a particular mission of espionage may go towards. Generally, espionage in this period is more long-sighted, is more strategic. However, in the run-up to the Dominion War, many of the strongest and proudest intelligence services were heavily degraded by various measures taken by the Dominion. The Dominion probably realizing that they were at quite the uh, disadvantage when it came to intelligence services and seeking to even the playing field. First intelligence service we're going to talk about is Klingon intelligence. Now, while these days Klingon intelligence is the butt of many jokes, in their day, in the 23rd century, Klingon intelligence was among the foremost in the Alpha and Beta quadrants. It really was something to be respected. They were very, very good when it came to uh, infiltration and intelligence gathering. Now, unfortunately, they suffered several setbacks in the 24th century, um, largely due to the fact that the Romulans enacted an active campaign to degrade the Klingons' intelligence capabilities. The Romulans would generally try to turn Klingon agents, meaning that a fair number of agents that were ostensibly working for the Klingons were in fact working for the Romulans, and those that they couldn't turn, they would take out. And so, one way or another, Klingon intelligence became uh, severely degraded in its capabilities and also uh, not the most trustworthy entity. And the subsequent result of that was that Gowron purged the organization after the Klingon Civil War because a lot of them had ties to the Romulans or were likely Romulan double agents, leaving them at the outbreak of the Dominion War with very little of an intelligence apparatus left. Uh, then we have the Romulans. During the mid-24th century, the Romulan Tau Shiar was basically number one in the quadrant. Uh, there really was no getting around it. The Romulans had the ability to infiltrate and influence every corner of the Alpha and Beta quadrant. Now, unfortunately, that capability was severely degraded with the cream of their crop being taken out in the Battle of the Omerian Nebula. They also, of course, lost uh, all their operatives that they had in the Klingon Empire. So, again, by the outbreak of the war, the Romulans have suffered setbacks. They're not completely... The Tal Shiar is, after all, a large organization, and the Romulan Empire is a large entity in and of itself. So it has a capacity to recover relatively quickly, but still, at the outbreak of the war, Romulan intelligence was in a diminished state. The same cannot be said of the Cardassian Obsidian Order, which was in a far worse state. Well, essentially, the Cardassian Obsidian Order actually suffered 
from both the problems that afflicted the Klingons and the Romulans, in as much as you have the Battle of the Omerian Nebula, which severely weakened the organization, but then it took a double whammy in the form of political purges after the Cardassian Revolution, because of course in Cardassia, the intelligence and security services were very much political and tied to the power of the old regime, and so a lot of those people were purged after the revolution and put in prison, meaning that they took a real hit to their intelligence apparatus and it wouldn't really recover until during the war. Then we have the Federation, who pretty consistently were playing second or third place, depending on where you put the Obsidian Order. The Federation intelligence services can be described as a good network of informants and some agents, but there's very little emphasis on internal security or counterintelligence. This is derived from experiences during the Tomed incident. The Federation really felt that actually allowing spies to operate not completely, you know, unchecked. You keep an eye on what the enemy spies are doing, but they took a live and let live approach to spies of other nations because they believed that that greater level of transparency would help avert future wars. You can question that wisdom, but they would ultimately pay for it because they were completely unprepared for the changeling infiltration that prefigured the Dominion War. After the shock of the changeling crisis and the changeling infiltrations, they really began to up their game when it came to internal security, but they were always playing catch up in that particular area. So finally, we come to, I suppose, the main star, but in many ways, the weakest of the five, Dominion Intelligence. The Dominion don't really make any use of agents or operatives. They are very reliant on third-party subcontractors for information collection, and analysis rather than themselves um, have intelligence assets they actually just outsource that to spy you know spy rings third-party independent operating spy rings and information brokers and basically get them to do most of the actual uh, information gathering there are obvious problems with that not least that they these are just as vulnerable to infiltration by other intelligence agencies, if not more vulnerable than just your own independent uh, capability. The other thing to bear in mind, they have changeling infiltrators, which are very good option when it comes to sabotage and direct action. But beyond that, they don't really have a great deal of use. The Dominion also really lack any kind of robust counterintelligence apparatus and really, for most of the war, were quite reliant on their Cardassian allies to clean house, so to speak. Okay, so at the outbreak of the Dominion War, the Federation is actually in the strongest position, then followed by the Dominion, by virtue of neither of them suffering any particular setbacks, followed by the Romulans, who were quickly recovering, then by the Cardassians, who have a very good culture behind them, and then by the Klingons. Klingon intelligence has had a rough ride of it in the past few decades. Now, it's worth saying that by the end of the war, all the Alpha Quadrant powers, including the Cardassians, would see an improvement in their intelligence gathering capabilities and their various espionage programs. It was only the Dominion that stayed relatively stagnant because the Dominion intelligence apparatus was not a sustainable one. It was one that, as we, as I say, is very reliant on third parties and also mostly puts emphasis on sabotage. Sabotage is great, but it means you burn your assets. Once you get a changeling infiltrator to perform some kind of sabotage, the enemy's counterintelligence assets are going to be wise to it and they're going to be looking for that particular operative. And so, you can use them once, and then that's it. With that in mind, we'll take a look at the various forms of intelligence gathering and how they factor together. The first thing I want to mention is that we need to draw a delineation between intelligence, which in wartime conditions is tantamount to rumour, and what we will call information. Information is something that is that has been cross-referenced and is actionable. It is concrete. You can be 
at least relatively certain that it is at least 60% true. It's not likely to be a deception. It may be inaccurate, it may be exaggerated, it may be, you know, any number of things, but it, there will be a, a grain of truth to it. That's the difference between information and general intelligence in wartime conditions. That's just white noise, and you're trying to sift out of intelligence actual actionable information. So you're going to be doing that by generally cross-referencing a number of different sources, which we'll go into. So... Obviously, the kind of the center of this matrix is data analysis. This is where you're going to cross-reference your different sources in order to produce actionable information. But then we have a whole series of different capabilities. We have really two schools of thought of capability. We have what I'll call remote capabilities, and then we have field capabilities. The first remote capability would be uh, open source intelligence, i.e., you know, you're just gleaning through general information that is publicly available and trying to put things together. Simple enough. That's really a matter of brute force a lot of the time. You just need lots of people. Or you can be very clever and compile an algorithm to do it. Another remote capability would be communication interception. Communications are, particularly during wartime, just pinged about all over the place. It's not difficult to intercept it. Now, decrypting that communication and actually understanding what the information contained is, that's another matter. Again, there's whole layers of encryption which we'll get to with counterintelligence. And then finally, we have agents and investigators. A investigator is someone who is operating... Uh, remotely, but they will go around and try and compile information from different sources. They will be commissioned to find something specific or build up a profile of somebody, uh, develop an understanding of a particular uh, planetary system, in-depth analysis of an enemy starship. When they become agents is when they go out into the field, and now we start talking about field capabilities, the lowest level of which is operatives. These are not people who are trained spies. These are native people to the area that they're spying on um, who just pass along little tidbits of information. Maybe public information or it may be something that somebody let slip one night after a few bottles of canar. But in any case, they then pass that information along back to headquarters via various clandestine means. Then we get to much more overt stuff. We get to reconnaissance, which of course is literally generally actual ships going around and flying around and uh, taking a look. Again, you can outsource that to third parties. You can say to a freighter captain who's neutral, a neutral freighter captain, oh, just maybe swing by the, uh, the Monac shipyards a little bit. Just a little bit, just getting kissing distance and then veer off. And uh, yeah, tell us what you see. Stuff like that. But that also can be military reconnaissance as well. Generally, they'll be conducted for different purposes. And then we have infiltration, which is where you, again, get someone in there to do whatever it is that needs doing. You need to get an agent in there, or maybe you need to get someone out. So exfiltration is another part of that. But again, that can be through a ship, a cloaked ship that you have, or that can again be through a third party that, that you subcontract. And then finally, the sort of the, the golden goose of intelligence gathering is a double agent or a defector. So somebody who has decided to defect, maybe they want to defect, but you say to them, no, stay in your position because you can glean us some very valuable information and you can tell us things. So you pass along the orders or the logistics requests that you've been receiving and then we can, you know, take care of that. I mean, yeah, if you're a, a low-level logistics person, um, a logistics clerk, and you get sent re requisition forms, well, individually, that might not mean much to you. But if you were to pass them along to a certain intelligence agent, they'll pass that along to... Uh, 
the analysts and they can cross-reference that with other things that are going on and they can produce very actionable information out of that. Maybe an offensive is being prepared and you may not even know yourself even though you're part of the military that is planning that offensive but they'll be able to know because they have eyes and ears everywhere. So that is actual intelligence assets and now we'll talk about the various means of counterintelligence that exist. This is basically a mirror image to what we just discussed. So when it comes to counterintelligence, so the mirror image of uh, open source intelligence is false information. Deliberately publish and promote false information or even just a confused information space that makes it very very difficult for your enemy to be able to tell what is true and what is not. Uh, with communication interception, uh, cryptography can be brought into play. You can also tie that in with uh, false information. So if you encrypt something very, very, very strongly, but actually it's just a false piece of information and you send that out knowing that it will be intercepted and decrypted, but because it was so heavily encrypted, the enemy is more likely to believe that this is actually real, reliable, strong information rather than a deception. And then when it comes to enemy operatives, one of the main counters you can undertake is observation. So keep track of what they are passing to the enemy. Maybe they're passing complete nonsense to the enemy, or maybe they are actually passing true information to the enemy. But now you know that the enemy knows your secret plan. So you can then anticipate from that and start planning. So, you know, perhaps perhaps this guy in the bar let slip that uh, a certain system was lesser defended than the others and the, the defences were very outdated and the ships are all undergoing repairs. And this is possibly very true. But now you know, because you were keeping an eye on this guy, you now know that he knows and that he's going to pass that along to his superiors and that may then get actioned in an attack on that system. And you can then action that by, by setting up a trap for the attacker. Uh, you can again also start passing them false information, although generally that diminishes the usefulness of that particular asset. Your idea is not to destroy these kind of assets, but you want to exploit them. They're, they're a dime a dozen, and if the enemy realizes that they're just parroting false information, they'll just start ignoring them. You don't want that. You want to make sure that they're mostly giving them true information. Because if they are giving true information, you can slip in those falsehoods and the enemy will take them much more seriously. And then finally, of course, with agents or investigators, people who we realize are perhaps quite problematic, you can just take them out. Particularly if they are quite instrumental in the enemy's intelligence apparatus and their decision-making chain and their information ecosystem. When we come to dealing with sort of active or field elements of intelligence, so facades are an excellent way of countering reconnaissance. So, you know, recon is obviously very clandestine, not always the most reliable thing because with things like Thoron fields and Duranium shadows and holograms, you can make things appear that simply aren't there. You can make an enemy think that there's an entire fleet somewhere where in fact there isn't one. It's fake, it's false, it's fiction, it's a complete fabrication. And with uh, infiltration, generally the main tactic you'll counter infiltration with is elimination. That's a valuable asset because generally if you're infiltrating or exfiltrating someone, they're a valuable intelligence asset and you're probably better off by taking them off the board entirely. So generally that's where uh, elimination will take place. Uh, and then finally we have triple agents. So, so this is someone who actually, maybe you get them to defect and give a load of false information or you tell them that they should start passing information to the enemy or maybe you catch them passing information to the enemy and you let them know that We've caught you and things will get very, very ugly for you and everyone you know if you don't start playing ball. So how about you start passing this information to the enemy and thereby you counter and 
turn to your advantage, a defector or double agent. These methods can be used to achieve objectives at the tactical, operational and strategic level. So at the tactical level that can be simply used to um, outmaneuver an enemy force or enact a, a trap. At the operational level it can be used to locate key vulnerabilities and objectives on the front lines. And on the strategic level you can use it to infiltrate an enemy command chain or ensure the continued support of an ally. After all, only friends can spy on each other like that. Right, so let's get into specializations. The different powers specialize in different forms of intelligence gathering assets. They obviously all maintain a broad spectrum of capabilities, but these are where the emphases are. The Federation makes great use of compromised assets, such as double agents or defectors, as well as operatives, and also in using its media. Federation media is huge and it dominates the, uh, the subspace network, and therefore they can project a lot of false information and white noise into the information space. With the Klingons, their emphasis is on much more direct capabilities, so reconnaissance, infiltration, and assassination. That's one art that the Klingons haven't forgotten. The Romulans put a great deal of emphasis on training up very capable agents and investigators to deal with the complex problems posed by a distorted or opaque information space. They're also very good at creating facades when you have an entire fleet that can appear and disappear at will. It's very easy to deceive the enemy and have them fighting ghosts. And finally, their capability to create triple agents, which is almost certainly a product of their uh, back and forth with Starfleet intelligence. Now we get to the Cardassians. Cardassians put a great deal of emphasis on communication and broad spectrum intelligence gathering, by which I mean uh, communications intercept, cryptography and counter cryptography, and open source intelligence gathering. You will notice these are large scale operations. So unlike other intelligence agencies, which are relatively small, the Obsidian Order employs thousands upon thousands upon thousands of analysts to just sift through raw information raw communications, encrypted um, messages, and to just brute force their way through any kind of uh, problem when it comes to the information space. And Cardassians are very analytical and calculating minds, and they're very, very good when it comes to recognizing patterns and drawing actionable information out of what seems like just gibberish to everyone else. Finally, as I mentioned with the Dominion, their capabilities are in infiltration, assassination, elimination, and sabotage. A very narrow set of capabilities in, in the grand scheme of things. So, to conclude, as I say, for every battle fought during, during the war, a campaign has been fought in the shadows. It's also interesting that Many of these intelligence services were actually heavily degraded in the run-up to the Dominion War. This could have been a true war of spies, but the Dominion didn't want that. And so, really, it was not the best outing for the intelli any of the intelligence agencies of the Alpha Quadrant, and they didn't really recover to their former state until really after the war, at which point there's no enemy to fight. But... Uh, that's where you get to go back to the old uh, Cold War style of espionage, which everyone enjoyed a lot more anyway. That's what made the intelligence agencies of the Alpha Quadrant so effective compared to those of the Dominion, because the Alpha Quadrant has for over 200 years been locked into one form of Cold War or another. And, well, in space you may say all warriors are Cold Warriors. I would say the true Cold Warriors are spies. They are the first and the last casualties of any war. 
and their war never ends. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you to my members for supporting this content and I will see you all next time.